Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We all want to be happy, don't we? I'd say really if you just get right down to it, if you could just find the bottom line of what everybody wants, we really just want to be happy. <laughs> we want to enjoy our life and be happy and and uh Attitudes are very, very, very important. And I'm going to say something to you that you may not believe right up here going into this, but hopefully you'll get a little more convinced as the time goes by this weekend. I believe that really it's not our circumstances that make us so unhappy. Now, I'm not saying they're not unpleasant and that they're not difficult and they're not challenging. And certainly they have the ability to steal our joy if we let them. But I really don't believe it's our circumstances that make us unhappy. I think it's our attitude in our circumstances. Can anybody kind of go that far with me tonight? It's our attitude in our circumstances that really make us unhappy. You may have heard this quote before, but Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust victim, said that they may take everything away from me here, human dignity, food, Every, every right that a human being should have, but one thing they cannot take away from me, and that's my decision to have a good attitude. And it's so true that if you will just, and I will just make a decision that we're going to have a good attitude, and a good attitude means that you can even take a bad situation and say, you know, I don't like this situation, but I believe I'm going to get something out of it. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to grow through it, and this too will pass. It's going to be over, and... How many of you know that after you come through difficult times, you usually are a much deeper, richer person inside? And, and haven't you found out that you really get to know God more deeply during those times? And so um, just before I get into the Beatitudes, which is what we're going to preach on this weekend about all the wonderful things that Jesus had to say when he shared what we call the Sermon on the Mount, I want to share a little, a little introduction with you to kind of get you to where I want you to be. First of all, I think we would all say without hesitation that Jesus had power when he was here on the earth. That he displayed power, he walked in power, there were healings and miracles, and actually he had so much power that there's times that we read about in the Gospels where he was just walking around and power was emanating from him. And one woman just walked up to him and touched him with her faith and was healed. And, and the Bible says that Jesus felt virtue or power go out of him. And he said, who touched me? So he didn't even have to purposely do anything. There was just so much power that if anybody had the faith to draw on it, that they could have it. But now, some translations say virtue went out from him. Others say power went out from him. And the word virtue is a very interesting word because these beatitudes that we're going to share about this weekend, they're considered Christian virtues, virtues of the soul, moral excellences of the soul that then actually will release the power of God that's in us into our life. Not only does God have power, not only did Jesus walk in power, not only is the Holy Spirit powerful, but he has shared that power with us. You have the power of God resident in you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You are not powerless, you are powerful. I said you are not powerless, you are powerful. You know, one of the things that Paul prayed for was that people would know the power that was available to them as believers in Christ. And so I wanna make sure that you know tonight that the power of God, the power of God, the power of God is, is resident, if you're a born-again believer, the power of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, come on, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwells in you, and it does if you're a believer, the Bible says it will quicken or bring to life not only your mortal body, but everything about your life. So we need to be power-minded, not pathetic-minded and pitiful-minded and 
And, you know, we, we just, we get into this self-pity thing so much, and I've got a problem, and follow me. And we need to realize that we have the power of God on our side. What is it? We, you know, we, we quote these scriptures, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. But you know what? You can get so accustomed to quoting something that you don't even know if you still believe it or not. And we need to stop long enough to ask ourselves, do I really believe that the power of God is available for me? Now, just because something is available, now hear me, just because something is available, that doesn't mean that God releases it in our life for you. This is where a lot of Christians get confused because we hear about what's ours in Christ and all the promises of God that are ours and all the power that's ours and all these things that are ours and yet they can't seem to access them in their life. And I'm just going to tell you as plain as I know how to, it's all tied to spiritual maturity and whether or not we're willing to grow up in God and become Christ-like in our character and our nature. The word virtue is found seven times in the New Testament, and three times it's translated from the word Greek word dunamis, which is translated power, the same word that you find in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive dunamis, or power, to be my witnesses. So there's three times when that word dunamis is not translated power, but it's translated virtue. So we learn from that that virtue and power are, in essence, the same thing. And, and then there's four times where the word virtue is translated excellence, but it actually refers to excellence of soul. You know how wonderful it is to have an excellent soul? To be excellent inside, to have a great inner life, to be excellent in your thoughts. I wrote it like this, if there's no virtue, excellence of moral character in us, then no virtue or power will flow from us. So even though I have that power of God resident in my soul, God's going to release that to me as I show myself to be responsible to be able to handle that power. Do you know, a lot of power given to a baby is going to be used for selfish, self-centered reasons. You take like the scripture, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. The Amplified says discipline and self-control. Well, how do people use that? They usually use the power to get what they want. We should be using that power against the enemy to stop him and the kingdom of darkness from robbing God's children. They take the love and they love themselves instead of loving other people, which is what we're supposed to be do, we're doing with it. And they take the self-control, which is to be used to control self and try to control other people. And so we really need to understand what all of these things mean and start applying them to our own life. Our character is our usual manner of behavior. It's what can be expected from us under every kind of a situation. So let, how many people do you know that I mean, they're great as long as everything is kind of going their way. But then, boy, when they don't get their way or when something goes sour, I mean, they, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde. You know, they become a totally different person. Well, see, a person who has really developed the kind of character that God wants them to have, they can be stable in every situation. Amen. That's just one example of what I'm talking about. They're not up and down and up and down when circumstances are up and down and they're not happy when they're getting what they want and not happy when they don't. They just, character is something that's it's in you. It's, it's deeply embedded in you and it becomes who you are. It's not just something you turn on and off like God cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot say he's going to do something and then not do it. Matthew 5 verse 1. Seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying. Now, the Amplified Bible gets pretty long in each one of these blesseds. So try not to get bored, but try to hang on to how, how amazing these words are. Blessed, happy to be envied, 
and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of your outward conditions. Wow. So he's saying no matter what's going on in your life, you can be happy and so blessed that people will envy you and envy your life. No matter what's going on in your life. Or, now that blessing is attached to a moral excellence or a virtue of soul called the poor in spirit, which really means the humble-minded, those who are totally dependent on God, and those who don't think that they're better than other people. The Amplified says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, who rate themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't particularly like that translation as well. You know, there's a lot of different translations of the Bible, and they're all really great, and I love the Amplified Bible, but I don't want anybody to think that where it says who rate themselves insignificant to think that that means you need to have a bad attitude about yourself. That's not what that means. I've thought about this and prayed about it a lot, and I'm convinced from a study, and that really what that means is they don't, they don't look at themselves as being better than other people. You know, that's where we get into trouble. When we start looking at other people and thinking, well, I'm smarter than you, I know more than you, I'm better than you, you know, I'm, I'm more important than you. And that's when we begin to look down on people and we begin to cause a lot of problems. Can you imagine if everybody in the world really honored every other person, no matter who they were, how wonderful this world would be? And I'm going to kind of fast forward through these because I'm going to, going to teach on them this weekend. I'm not going to go through everything that blessed means in every verse, but then it goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, you're probably going, huh, what? Well, we'll get around to that. Blessed are the meek, the mild, the patient, the long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be completely satisfied. Number seven, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What, what a wonderful inward trait that is to be merciful, to be ready to give somebody mercy and not ready to, you know, throw them out of your life every time they make a mistake. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's probably one of my favorite ones right there. Blessed are the makers and the maintainers of peace, for they shall be called the sons of God. Number 10, blessed are those who are persecuted <laughs> for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in case once wasn't enough, 11, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you on my account. Verse 12, be glad and supremely joyful, for your reward in heaven is great and strong. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then the last one, it's actually probably wouldn't be considered a beatitude, but I'm putting it in with this with this group, the rest of this, where he talks about you're the light of the world and how we need to do good deeds and people will see their heavenly father. I think that's basically talking about being unselfish and learning how to really love other people. So this weekend, God willing and by his grace and mercy, we are going to talk about nine of these be happy attitudes. And the first one that we want to talk about tonight is the humble minded are the powerful. So in other words, if we can manage to be totally dependent on God, that's a power position. And if we can be humble, and that involves a lot of different things, we're going to talk about some of the things that it actually involves. Because it sounds nice, but when you really get right down to it, it involves things like not having to be right all the time. See, now I get a little noise out there. <laughs> See how easy it was when I said be humble-minded? It was like, yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord, yes, be humble-minded. <laughs> or it means things like not having to have the last word. <laughs> Do you know that being right is highly overrated? <laughs> you know that? I mean, it is amazing the fights that we get into just to be right. 
big whoop. But you know what? So one other person has conceded that you're right, probably just to shut you up. They probably don't think you're right anyway. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know what a Webster's 1828 dictionary is or not, but it was the original Webster's dictionary. And I forget what percentage of it, but like, I don't know, 70% of or something was filled with the Word of God. It's far cry from what dictionaries are today, but I have one of those, and you can actually get one. They're not even all that expensive, $20 or something, I think. And, uh, but the Webster's 1828 dictionary defines virtue like this. Strength, bravery, valor, moral goodness. The practice of moral duties and the abstaining from moral vices. Virtue must, now listen to this, virtue must be distinguished from religion because religion is often seen in outward acts only, whereas a virtue is a matter of the heart. So a person can go to church, praise the Lord, thank you Jesus, glory to God, hallelujah, they can sing the songs on the overhead. They can have their hands lifted up and be looking at the person across the aisle from them thinking, you are the dumbest looking thing I have ever seen in my whole life. Looking at the people on the platform. Well, you couldn't sing your way out of a paper bag. Come on. So we got the religion. We got the religion part. We've ascribed to a set of doctrines and we show up in the building and we park our little fanny in the pew and we clap at the right time and say amen at the right time. But what is going on inside? What's happening inside? It's the hidden man of the heart that God is concerned about. And I really, if I don't do anything else this weekend, I hope to get you to really get in touch and to pay attention to what's going on in you. We have power in us. It's resident in us. But in order for it to be released, God needs to trust us with it. Everybody else may not know what's going on inside of us, but God does. And he says the most important thing to him is the hidden man of the heart. And then just to go on with this definition out of that dictionary, it says, virtue is nothing but voluntary obedience to the truth for nothing other than the sincere love of God. And I love that. We don't obey the word just to get something. But we obey the word because we love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. I do a lot of things that I wouldn't ordinarily do or wouldn't want to do, but I'll do it because I love God and I know that someday I'm going to stand before Him and give an account of my life. And although I know I'm covered by His grace, I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to do the best I can. And my best is imperfect, but I'm still going to do the best I can. And I'm glad for the grace that covers the imperfect part, but that doesn't mean that I get to live with a sloppy, half-baked attitude that says, oh, well, God loves me and, you know, He's going to cover me and... Amen? I want to see some godly warriors rise up and take their rightful place and stand in the presence of God and, and draw a line in their life for morality and stop compromising and just kind of floating along with everybody else in their religious boat and just, you know, compromising all the time. We need to take a stand for what's right. We need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's a particular moral excellence of the soul that manifests in things like temperance, chastity, charity, <laughs> patience, humility, meekness, mercy, things like that. So, to be blessed is a wonderful thing. 
I mean, it's actually a wonderful thing. You know, we, we throw that word around a little bit too loosely, I think, in the church. How are you? I'm blessed. Well, are you really? You know? I mean, legally, you may be blessed, but are you happy? I mean, are you really happy no matter what your circumstances are? Do you have such a happy life that people envy your happy life? They're like, man, I wish I was as happy as that person is. <laughs> well, no, not really. Actually, I'm blessed, but I spent three weeks, you know, being depressed and discouraged and despondent. And Actually, I was mad because I didn't get the promotion I wanted at work. Well, but praise the Lord, I'm blessed. Blessed when I go in and blessed when I go out. Yes, sir, that's me, the blessed of the Lord. <laughs> Come on, I'm just trying to get us all to wake up a little bit, you know? <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know they need God. I want you to think for a minute about, and it, it was too late for me to get one and bring it, but let's just say that I had a, a branch off of a peach tree up here, and it had three luscious peaches hanging down from it. How many of you know the total weight of that peach is on the branch? Well, he's the branch or the vine, and we're the fruit. He wants us to bear good fruit. We have to hang and be totally dependent on God at all times. Totally dependent on God for all things at all times. And you know, we usually start out in our walk with God pretty independent. How many of you would say that's pretty much right? You know, we're pretty independent. We even like to suggest to God sometimes how he could get things done. <laughs> have you ever done that? I have one. You know, God, you could do this. I mean, have you ever thought of this, God? I mean, you could just do that. <laughs> and we're so silly to think that God might need advice from us, you know? I mean, all we have to do is think about the Apostle Peter when he rebuked Jesus to know how dumb we can be at times. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are humble-minded, who don't see themselves as being better than other people, who treat everybody with excellence. You know, like, like here is a really excellent attitude. Th this is a great be happy attitude. Just, just this attitude. Everybody is important. See, I mean, that, that's a great attitude. Everybody is important. You know, you might, how would, how would you treat, like think about how you would treat me, <laughs> and I've actually had this happen, like be trying to get through traffic after a meeting and having somebody determined to cut me off and get out in front of me till they see it's me. <laughs> you get my point, right? So we should not treat people that we want to impress one way and treat who I guess we think are the little people, which is dumb because in God's eyes, we're all equal. There's no more male nor female, more, no more Jew nor Greek. No more slave nor free. You see, everything that I am and everything that you are, everything that you can do that's good and everything that I can do that is good is a gift of God's grace in our life. You know, we cannot always control all of our circumstances, but we do have the God-given ability to control our attitudes. We can learn how to live by the Word of God, and it will absolutely be life-changing for us. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true, and that He changes lives, and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld... concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen... het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. 
We do humanitarian works all over the world. You know, here we are in Haiti. I'm here in Thailand. Thessaloniki, Greece. In the back bush of Africa. On the Mekong River. In the city of Phnom Penh. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is, this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change, you can get healing, you can survive. This little girl at 10 years old escaped on her own from sex trafficking. She lives on the streets. She was rounded up by vans that travel around and steal these children. They were actually weighing the little girls so that they could ship them out of the country. And she was able to sneak away and escape. She ran to the tent that you see behind me where we feed the children and ask for safety. So we're able to feed Farisua here every day. We're able to grant her just a little bit of safety and to help her in any way that we can to tell her about Christ and just to love on her a whole bunch because she's an awesome little girl. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan een mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand.